Hey everyone, it's Mr. N, and uh, we're at it again. This is the chapter 7 for the whole chapter of the review. Um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started with it and take a look at what we got. Uh, one thing to note on this is important for you to have your formula sheet handy. Make sure you've memorized a lot of it. Um, again, it's on the website if you need another copy. All right, so taking a look at this first one. Uh, we can use L'Hopital if needed to find the limit of each on this first one. First, we try direct substitution. Let's plug the zero in. Sine of, we'll get zero over the tangent of zero. We end up with zero over zero, which is indeterminate. Since we have an indeterminate form, we can use L'Hopital. So let's go ahead and L-hop this. And we end up with the limit as x goes to zero. And I'm going to take the derivative of the top. And the derivative of the top would be cosine 7x times 7. The derivative of the bottom would end up being secant squared 11x times 11. So I took the derivative of the top, derivative of the bottom, and now let's go ahead and do direct substitution again. Let's see if it works. I plug in 0. I'm going to get cosine of 0, which is 1, times the 7, and secant squared. Well, the secant of <clears throat> 0 is going to be 1 because that's 1 over the cosine, so we'll get, end up with 1 times 11, so this answer is 7 over 11. Again, if you got an, another indeterminate form, you just keep L-hopping. L-hop until it works. All right, All right for number 2, um, our first instinct here would probably be to use a limit law and break this apart, but if you try that, you'll end up with the limit as x goes to 0 of 1 over sine x minus the limit of 1 over x as x goes to 0. And then if you take the derivative of the top, you'll get 1, and then you have to take the derivative of that sine x on the bottom. So you could try doing that. That is one option. So let's go ahead and do that. So if I apply a little limit law here, and we do this, the limit as x goes to 0 of 1 over x. So now, okay, this is indeterminate because when I tried direct substitution, it didn't work. Same with the other side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to L-hop. I L-hop the top. The derivative of a constant is 0. And then the derivative of the bottom ends up being cosine x. Well, here, when I take the limit, as it approaches 0, I'm going to get 0 over 1, which is 0. So the limit as x goes to 0, I'll get 0 over 1, which is 0 in this case. Regardless, it's going to be 0. Now, on this side, when I L-hopped it, I end up with, this is x to the negative 1 power. Or actually, sorry, I should just say it's 1 over x. So we're going to take the derivative of the top. We end up with the same thing, 0, and the derivative of the bottom, which is going to be 1. 0 over 1, so we end up with minus 0. There's our, there's our limit. It's at 0. Another route to tackle this problem would be to find a common denominator here. And that would be x sine x. And now on the numerator, uh, you would end up with x minus the sine x. So we've got the top, we've got the bottom. And we could try doing it this route. You're going to have to L-hop it. This one, you'll probably end up having to L-hop twice, to be honest with you. And you'll still are going to get that same answer of 0 in the end. So that's just another route here. And I, most textbooks would probably take this route. Okay, moving on to number three. Looking at this, as we go to infinity, well, we could just apply a limit law that we know. We don't have to L-hop. You, By all means, you certainly can L-hop it, but um, we're not going to on this one. Because this is, if you plug it in, we get infinity over infinity of that indeterminate form. But let's recall what we did with limits. With limits, we just took these highest powers. You could divide it by the x squared, everything. But we just said, look, if these highest powers match, this limit's just going to be negative 2 thirds. OK, so then moving on to number 4. On number 4, we've got this situation where we've got two parts. Well, this is infinity times infinity. If you plug it in, that's what you'll end up doing. So we're going to rewrite this whole thing so we can L-hop it. We're going to say the limit as x goes to infinity of ln x, and I'm going to rewrite this as e to the positive 2x down below. Now, at this point, again, you'll get infinity over infinity, but we can L-hop now because we've separated out into a numerator and a denominator, so we can L-hop it. So let's go ahead and do that. So we end up with 1 over x. On the bottom, we're going to end up with e 
the 2x times 2 when I take the derivative. And we want this to limit as x goes to infinity. So we plug that in. On the, This ends up just simply being 1 over x e to the 2x times 2. So the top is 1. The bottom is just going to end up being a very, very large number, which ends up going to 0. Okay, let's move on. Let's take a look at number 5. Find the derivative of each of these. All right, for this first one, y prime is going to end up being 4. So remember, this is ln x to the fourth power. So 4 ln x to the third times 1 over x. We need to chain rule that part. So we end up with y prime equaling 4 ln x to the third. And on the bottom, we just have that x. So we can simplify it like that. All right, moving on to number six, taking the derivative. We're going to have to apply a quotient rule here. So f prime of x is going to be the bottom 2 ln x times the derivative of the top, which is 3x squared, minus the top, x cubed, times the derivative of the bottom. The derivative of the bottom, in this case, is just going to be 2 times 1 over x. So that 2 is our constant right there, so 2 times that 1 over x. So we end up... Let me put a dot there over the bottom squared here, 2 ln x, this quantity squared. Okay, so now, let's. it's just a matter of reducing this. Just reduce it to what we can. Again, if it's a multiple choice test, you'll have to fully reduce. On a free response, they're not as strict with that. So let's go ahead and take a look. We end up with 6x squared ln x minus this, we'll go with that. 2x squared all over this 4ln squared x. We can just rewrite it like that. You could certainly take out an x squared and a 2, and you'll end up with ln x minus 1 over this 4ln x, ln squared x. This will reduce with that to put a 2 down here. So we can simplify our final answer to say f prime of x equaling x squared ln x minus 1 all over ln squared x. We can leave it in that form. All right, for number 7. Again, this is a rule that we need to know. It's a to the x. So a to the x ends up being a to the x times ln a. So this derivative will end up being 2 to the negative 4x times ln 2. Now i got to apply the chain rule and take the derivative of that guy. So that ends up being times negative 4. Okay, so now let's just clean it up a bit and we'll say negative 4 ln 2 times 2 to the negative 4x. I'm just going to go ahead and rewrite it like that. All right, we are on number 8. For number 8, taking a look at this, um, what we can do is be careful. This sign is not signed to the negative 1 power. So we know this as being the arc sign. So let's go ahead. This is the arc sign. So we know that. So we are going to rewrite this and look at our <clears throat> formula for the derivative of the arc sign. And in this case, f prime of x is going to be 1 over the square root of 1 minus this 5x squared times the derivative there of that 5x, which would be 5. So remember that formula. Now, f prime of x, we'll just, we can just rewrite this as 5 over the square root of 1 minus 25x squared. Okay, so remember, when we take the derivative of that arc sign, it's 1 over, we said, 1 minus that a squared value. So, But then we have to apply a chain rule. So times the du dx part. Okay, moving on to number 9. So in number 9, we've got something similar going on here. And we've got the arc sign this time. So let's work with the arc sign. Now, remember... Arc sine is the same thing, again, that we tend to write it like that sometimes. So, same thing, arc sine. We have our formula, 1 over 
the square root of that 1 minus the a, a or in case, this case it's going to be u. Our u is going to be that 3x. So f prime of x is going to be this 2, first of all, stays right there. Then this becomes the square root of 1 minus, and I'm going to take my u value right there, squared, times this du right here, which ends up being 3. So when all is said and done, f prime of x is going to be 6 over the square root of 1 minus 9x squared. Just like that. And in this last one, it's the a to the x formula once again. And so for this one, f prime of x will be 3 to the x minus 2 times the ln 3 times the derivative of that, which is just going to be 1 in this case. So let's just rewrite this to look nice and clean. 3x to the minus 2 times the ln 3. There we go. All right, let's move on. Let's take a look at what we got next. Now we're doing integrals. For this first one, we need to integrate, and we are given the integral of 8 over the square root of 36 minus x squared. So again, we have to look at our formula sheet. And when we look at that, we will realize that this is the arc sine. That's what it resembles. This is what you have to memorize. This is the hardest part, is identifying this without having that formula sheet in front of you. So the arc sine, we had the integral of 1 over a squared, the square root, sorry, a squared minus our x squared and our dx here. So in this case, let's go ahead and use a substitution rule to make it a little bit easier. I'm going to take the, this 8 outside first, and I'll have 1 over the integral, and I'm going to rewrite this as 6 squared minus x squared. And in this case, we know that a is going to be 6. We're going to say let u equal x, so that means du equals our dx value. So we end up with 8 times the integral of, we're going to substitute that dx to be du. We're going to make this our 6 squared minus the u squared, and this ends up being the arc sine, so the inverse sine, of u over a plus c, so this answer is u, which is x, a, which we called 6, plus c, and don't forget we had this 8 on the outside right there, so we still got that 8. All right, moving right along, number 8, or number 12, sorry. Again, we've got 8 over 9 plus 4x squared. We look at our formula sheet, we memorize all this, we end up realizing that this is going to be the inverse tangent formula. So we're going to take the 8 out again. We have the integral of 1 over 9 plus 4x squared dx. So what we can break this apart, we could say our a is that, our u is going to be 2x. So we're going to let u equal 2x, so du equals 2 dx, so du over 2 is my dx. So I can go ahead and rewrite this to be the integral, and we've got the 8 on the outside of 1 over, now this is going to be 3 squared plus, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot so we said 3 squared plus the u squared. And here we end up with dx as being du over 2. And we're going to bring this out now to be 4 because this 2 reduces with that 8. 1 over 3 squared plus u squared du. And we said that we knew that this was the inverse tangent, so it's the arc tangent. So we end up with 4 times, now we have 1 over my uh, a value, which was 3, again, a squared is 9, so a is 3, and this ends up being the arc tangent, and then we've got our 2x, which is the u, over our a, which is 3, plus c. And you can clean this up if you want to say 4 thirds, the arc tangent, 
of 2x over 3 plus c. Okay, looking at this one right here, let's go ahead and move this one up over here a little bit. So we've got this integral. We know the integral of e to the x is just e to the x, just like the derivative of e to the x. So if I let u equal my 3x plus 2, du will be 3 dx. And now I could just make my basic substitution here. We've got the integral of e to the u times du over 3, which is my dx. So 1 third the integral e to the u du, which is 1 third e to the u plus c. Let's go ahead and resubstitute, and our u was 3x plus 2 plus our c. So that one was not too bad. All right, moving on to number 14. On number 14, this is just the basic integral for a to the x. And in this case, it's going to end up being a to the x over ln a. So in this case, it's 4 to the x over ln 4 plus c. Okay, for number 15, um, let's go ahead on this one and let's let u equal this 1 minus e, or 1 plus e to the negative x. So that means du will be e to the negative x times negative 1 dx. So that means du over negative e to the negative x is my dx. All right, so let's make our substitution. In this case, we end up with the integral of e to the negative x over u times du over e negative e to the negative x. So I made my substitution right in there. So that reduces with that. So I end up with negative the integral of du over u. Well, that's just ln absolute value of u plus c with this negative out in front right there. So now we can resubstitute, and we will end up with negative ln absolute value of 1 plus e to the negative x plus rc. All right. Moving on to the next page. Now, on this one, we have to find the inverse derivative for that value, at, for that function at a equals 6. So let's recall what our inverse derivative formula uh, is. Let me write it correctly. So the inverse derivative at a is 1 over f prime of f, oops, inverse of a, like that. So that means we need to find what our derivative of this is. So our derivative is going to be 3x squared minus, now this is 4 times x to the negative 1, so that's going to be negative 4x to the negative 2. So let's just clean this up and write this as 3x squared plus 4 over x squared. So we went ahead and cleaned that up. Now we want to find a derivative there, we got to find out what that value is. So let's find the inverse. That's our next step here. We need to find the inverse of that function so I can plug it in there and then get that derivative value. All right, so to find the inverse, we are going to switch the x and y for this one. So we're going to end up with x equals y cubed minus 4 over y. Well, we want to know at our x value of 6. That's our a. So that means 6 equals y cubed minus 4 over y. Now, this one, you could multiply everything by y and go ahead and factor it. But just if you just take a look at it and think, okay, what are some basic numbers to see if this works? Especially if it's a non-calculator part of the test. Or it's got to come out to be a whole number, a nice number somehow. So if I try 1, I'll get 1 minus 4. Nope. If I try 2, okay, so let's try making y equal to 2. So I end up with 6 equals, this becomes 2 cubed minus 4 over 2. 2 cubed is 8 minus 2. Yep, it checks out. So y ends up being our value of 2 here. So now we know that y is 2, so that means that's the a. So that means that f inverse of 6 is 2. So that's what we want to do here. We need f prime of 2. So let's find what f prime of 2 ends up being. Let's plug this in. We get 3 times 2 squared, which is 4, 
uh, plus over here 4 over 2 squared, which is 4. So I end up with 12 plus 1, which is 13. So this answer ends up being 1 over 13. All right, moving on to our final problem, and this involves Newton's law of cooling. On this one, it says a waitress pours coffee into your cup at 8 a.m. The coffee is 170 degrees when freshly poured and after three minutes. So our initial temperature is 170 degrees. Our time is three minutes. In a room temperature, that's the temperature of our surroundings, 72 degrees, and it has cooled to 140 degrees as our final temperature. Now we develop what Newton's law of cooling formula is through exponentials and we just came up with our basic formula oops that should be T sub s equals T sub naught minus T sub s e to the kt. We developed this formula with exponentials. So let's just plug in the values because the formula is always going to be the same here. And our step one should always be find k for all of these types of problems because k varies every single time depending on the constants I'm given, the surrounding temperatures, all that. k will always be different. So that's our first step, find k. This t right here we said can be also called t sub f. It's our final temperature, so it's fine. So let's plug everything in we have our final temperature of 140 degrees minus our surroundings, which is 72, equals our initial temperature was 170 when we coffee was first poured. Our surroundings is 72, e to the k, and this is 5 minutes. Or, I'm sorry, 3 minutes. 3 minutes. So let's go ahead and solve this. This ends up being 68 equals 98 e to the 3k. So if we divide this and then take our natural log of 68 over 98 ln, we just end up with 3k. And here we can, at this point, just clean this up and get k equaling negative 0.1218. So that's our value of k. So let's finish it now. We have a new final temperature that we want to try to achieve, 100 degrees. So 100 minus 72. So I'm using this formula once again right here. Oops. So right there. That whole formula, okay? Um, I should have done it in a different color, but that's okay. So this ends up equaling, let's go back to the pen, uh, 170, which was our initial temperature, minus 72, our surroundings, E, now we have a value for K, 0.1218, negative, and then time T. So this time we're solving for the time. So 28 equals 68, oops, 98, 98, E to the negative 0.1218, T. So 28 over 98 then we want the natural log of that, and then we divide that by negative 0.1218. You can, you can uh, pause here and see what I did in between to get all those steps. We end up with t equals 10.29 minutes, so we're going to say approximately 10.3 minutes. Okay, 0.3 minutes, 60, so 0.3 of a minute, 60 seconds, that's going to be 18 seconds. So 10 minutes, 18 seconds after it was first poured. So the time will be 8, 10, and 18 seconds. There we go. So that's Newton's Law of Cooling. All right, hopefully this uh, review helped. Uh, make sure you ask me questions in class, and good luck on your test, and we'll see you next time.